Hi, my name is Kimmy. Um, I'm from California, San Joaquin Valley, California, and I've been in Mexico as of next week, 20 years. Hi, I'm John. I'm from uh, Pennsylvania, but I was born and raised here in Mexico. I came to Mexico when I was four years old and pretty much been here ever since. Uh, what brought me here, my parents are missionaries, so I grew up here. They brought me here as a kid, and then I came back uh, in 2012 uh, just to kind of, I don't know, come back to see where I grew up, and then I met my wife and stayed here. In California, I was a paramedic and a firefighter, and I had really felt like I was part of the rat race, and... I had two small children and sometimes I wouldn't see them all week long except for a few hours and we had an opportunity to come to Mexico for a one year working vacation and I decided to come and I really fell in love with Merida and I decided to stay. Uh, in my opinion, what makes uh, Merida attractive to foreigners is um, I don't know, just the pace of life. I think also it's a pretty safe city and uh, proximity to beaches. I think a lot of people like that uh, closeness to the beach. You can always sneak away. And it's an opportunity really to focus on your family and yourself and personal growth. The thing that I like most about Merida is the family values. It's a very, as mentioned before, a very slow paced life, but the family values is one of the things that uh, made me fall in love with Merida. The Yucatecan people are very lovely and um, very laid back. The food is a lot of fun. It's a lot of gastronomia and great things to eat. And there's a lot of fun activities for individuals, for families, for groups of people. There's a lot of beautiful things about Merida, but particularly the culture. The culture is really great. And for you, Lo? Yeah, I think the, my favorite part, probably the same. I like the pace of life. I like the... I like the heat. I mean, it's pretty hot, but I prefer <laughs> hot over cold. Um, I like that it's close to the beach. Uh, I like habanero. I really like spice and beer in the habanero capital. So it's nice. I'd have to say what I dislike about Merida right now is the growth. It's getting really big. Um, it has grown exponentially in the last three years and probably that so traffic has been a little out of hand. We don't really have the infrastructure for big traffic. The process of learning Spanish about the first year and three months was a very, very hard process. I, uh, I made a lot of mistakes in the beginning. Uh, the most famous story or the funniest story is, is that the soccer coach told me to bring tacos to uh, the football field, and I didn't speak any Spanish, and it was before cell phones, it was before Google Translate, and I remember um, pulling out my book uh, and going tacos. So the next day I show up to the field with two tacos, thinking it's strange that they wanted me to only bring two tacos for all these children, and tacos also means cleats. So uh, the coach started laughing, everybody started laughing, but now obviously I speak really great Spanish, and and I tell people is to really put yourself out there, to really embarrass yourself. Don't be afraid of being embarrassed. It's really important. It's really essential to make local friends and to really put in the effort. Uh, the local people love it. Uh, Yucatan love when we try to speak Spanish. So even there's often still there are words that I don't know or I don't know how to pronounce it or I pronounce it wrong. And everybody here loves when you make an effort. So I tell people all the time, it's really important to try to talk to the people in the tienda and to extend yourself to talk to everybody that you meet um, in Spanish and not force people to try to speak English. I was in Guadalajara at first and my parents and all my brothers and sisters were older. So they went to school and were like learning Spanish. And my parents, uh, they had to leave me with somebody. So they hired a nanny. Uh, a Mexican nanny and you know I picked it up she all day she was just there talking to me in Spanish <laughs> so I learned it pretty quick yeah. John and I often encourage the people with younger children to put them in only Spanish speaking uh, schools that way they learn Spanish faster I find that the children will pick up Spanish much faster than us adults and particularly if they're immersed in um, a Spanish speaking group of children I find that uh, it's important when newcomers arrive to the Yucatan, that it's really important to 
peruse and buy from the local stores, to buy your birthday gifts and Christmas gifts also from the local artisanals, to integrate themselves more into the community. Often, and John and I believe we can both say this, often we see newcomers come in and they really look for that experience. Let's say that they're from the United States and they look for a group of friends from the United States and they make a little subgroup of people from the United States and they only hang out with them, socialize with them, eat with them. And we know people that have been here 30, 40, 50 years. The way that they've done really well is, is by integrating themselves 100%. I would say the the biggest advice, we kind of already mentioned it, but really is just lean into it. Lean into all the culture. Uh, if, you, if you're a family and you have, uh, you know, you put your kids in school, the school is going to have loads of activities and things. Go to all of them, yeah. just jump in. It would be to try to find local friends, to purchase locally, to stay away from, if you can, Costco and Walmart, uh, to buy more local, to make more eat in local restaurants that are owned also by locals. And I'm not gonna say we never peruse the restaurants or go to the restaurants of our friends who own restaurants here that are foreigners. I get asked this question a lot about Yucatecan culture and about the acceptance of Yucatecans of foreigners. I have always been very warmly welcome into the Yucatan community. I have many very good friends that are Yucatecan. It's really important to come with a pure heart, with love and true respect of the Yucatecan culture, and you will be embraced and loved. Maybe since I came back, my life has changed. Um, I came back in 2012. Uh, it's changed for the better. I mean, I, I can definitely, I, li I like America, but I definitely don't necessarily want to live there. Um, and the culture, pace of life, just everything Mexico is just so much better. It's uh, easy. Just, it this this really, for me, is home. So when I go back to the States, it just feels weird. In the U.S., I felt like um, I didn't have enough time for my family. I didn't have enough time to do fun things in life, to enjoy life, to take a day off from work without pressure here. I mean, everything is about family. Everything is about your children. And so for me, the quality of life has been substantially better. Um, and not just in terms of the financial. Obviously, we live in a nice house that we would not be able to afford in the United States. But just the quality of time that you're able to spend with family and friends. We constantly are going out. We're constantly having dinners. We're constantly doing lots of really fun and amazing things that every time, and I visit the U.S. quite frequently. I have three children living there that just moved there. They grew up here. And every time I'm there, I mean, they're all so busy. Everybody's very busy. Um, we're here, it's just a slower paced life. So the quality of life for both of us is uh, wonderful here. And that's why I've decided to stay here. A newcomer coming in might not have a deep understanding of the education system. And I particularly find this very interesting. Um, most people can afford to go to private schools. And private schools here range from U.S. dollars, 40 bucks a month, all the way up to 300 or 400 U.S. dollars. But all private schools here are two years more advanced than any school in the U.S., except for private school. So a big surprise for a lot of people that come here, they come with this misconception that Mexico is not academically succeeding, and they're wrong. Every child of mine that's gone here and integrated themselves into the United States is two years, one and a half to two years more advanced than any high schooler of the same age as them, which gives my children, has been giving my children this great benefit academically because if they were struggling here or average students here, they go to the U.S. and they're above average students. We had a wonderful process finding the home. We did work with a local agent, um, a non-English speaking agent, which I think gave John and I, it opened the doors to a lot more properties. Uh, a majority of the English speaking realtors are wonderful, but they're really focused on a very certain market where John and I, both being Spanish speakers, were able to expand our search. And John and I also didn't have a lot of limitations on location. We didn't wanna to be too far from schools, office work. And we didn't have a idea that we just wanted to be in the Centro or we just wanted to be at the beach, which opened up the door hugely in finding a somewhat inexpensive house for what we have. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, we also we did a fair amount of driving around uh, in addition to. So for finding a house, you know, the U.S. has like Zillow and 
other such platforms where you can really easily find a lot of properties. Here, I, I haven't seen, um, I don't think there's anything that that's, that's that developed. So you really do have to kind of search, do a lot of searching online to really make sure you're, you're giving yourself the best chance to find what you want. So, I mean, we've lived here forever, but we just kind of came across this area and, and liked it. Um, you know, we basically live in a, it's a village really. It's a village within the city. Uh, so it's cool. It's got a really cool uh, small town. A few, a few doors down, there's horses. There's goats. There's, there's just, goats behind on the other side total, of this wall. It's, it's mayhem. It's very Mexico. Just no <laughs> rules, really. Total mayhem, but it's, it's cool. We yeah, like it. we love it a lot. The process for doing and buying a home in Mexico is a little bit different in terms of you have to have something called a fideicomiso, and the fideicomiso is held by a secondary party. So there was a little bit of a little bit different process. I know in the United States and in Canada, you can buy a house a little bit faster. And here it took us about three months to get all the paperwork in order, but it wasn't too bad. It, within three months uh, from start to finish, we were in our home, which was very great. We, we felt very fortunate of that. Was also, I think, possibly different was the the down payment uh, that we did was Eesh. actual cash, which I just <laughs> was wild to me. So I mean, it, so we just I like walked into the the lawyer's office with like a bag full of cash. It felt like a drug deal, kind of, but it was totally legit. We do highly recommend to new newbies that are here um, that are buying homes that they should really work with a lawyer. We find work, we had our own private lawyer who double checked all of our paperwork, which is really a great idea. So, yeah. you know, we do know so, of a few experiences here that weren't maybe so favorable like ours. And the way to avoid that is just doing everything through a lawyer and a notary. Yeah. It's also, I think it's good to have another set of eyes. I mean, it, 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 it wasn't very expensive and it was totally worth it to kind of protect yourself, protect your investment. Yeah. Also everything. I mean, even, even though we speak Spanish, I mean, the, the legal documents, uh, you know, the it legal terms, it's, I, I mean, it's very confusing, yeah. even for me or for us who've been here forever. So having somebody who actually can read the document and understand it is, is pretty, pretty crucial. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I earned a living. I started working I don't know, maybe 10 years ago before the pandemic, before it was cool. I was working online, um, a couple different companies, but it's, I just do sales online work from home. Uh, so it's been pretty great. Um, I like I like working from home and uh, don't have to travel anywhere. It's pretty nice. He's often in a bathing suit for weeks at a time. And we're very lucky that he's dressed in nicer clothes today. Nice. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome world. <laughs> I own a chiropractic physical rehab center. We also offer massage. I've been doing that for 20 years here. So I bring doctors of chiropractic from the United States or there are some here um, to work for me. And we do physical rehab. We help people that have sciatic and injuries pre and post op um, also. In the last 20 years, we've only raised our prices 250 pesos. Um, we've always tried to really work hard to make care, healthcare affordable for everybody. We have a program called Wellness Kids. Children can come in for 200 pesos for treatment, which is you know $10. Um, and we also have a, another program, which is called Baja Recursos, and we take on one to three um, low-income people a month. Um, and often we go out to villages um, and give free care, too. But when we came, it was a franchise, and within that franchise, we grew. And then at some point in all of the mess of that or, you know, recreating almost my U.S. lifestyle here again, and living a hectic lifestyle, at some point I woke up and was like, what am I doing? How did I recreate all this here, this extra work? And then I took a step back and left the company for a small amount of time and then took it over and bought out all of my partners. Then I was the sole owner. I've been the sole owner for nine years. And then I guess about four years ago or three years ago, I left the franchise. It was really focused on shorter times with the patients and a lot of protocols. The quality of healthcare here as a paramedic being transplanted in New Mexico is 1,101 million times better than it could be in the United States. And I see it on a day-to-day -day basis. 
U.S. doctors are burnt out. They're tired. They're exhausted. They don't get enough time with their patients. Um, here in Mexico, it is not the same. And often, many doctors here are cross-trained and also educated from the U.S. And here, uh, we have unbelievable healthcare. For an example, my gynecology visits, she's one of the best specialists in the country and a visit with her is 800 pesos. Um, and I have her WhatsApp and I can talk to her whenever I want if I have questions about my health. There's a hospital here called Fido and they have some of the best cardiology equipment in the whole country. Also things like logistical things like, uh, you know, getting, getting in and getting seen is very same day. I mean, very, very accessible and easy to do. Yeah. Um, it, versus, you know, in the States or other places where you might be waiting days, weeks, months, or however long to get seen, this is not the case at all. And it's just obviously way cheaper. So that's a huge plus. I have a nonprofit foundation here that I started unofficially about 10 years ago. And it became official around seven years ago. It's called Yucatan Giving Outreach. It is a pretty wide variety foundation that has a lot of different programs. Like for an example, we have our two own shelters for children who have aged out of orphanages and have nowhere to go. Uh, we also have no mas bolsas de basura if a child leaves the shelter and he um, is going to be located into a home. We give him suitcases. We also have a secondhand store and a food bank. During the worst parts of the pandemic, we handed out 14,500 food bags, which fed 54,000 people for a week. We have a wide scope of helping out needs. The only areas that we don't really cover are medical. It's one of the biggest organizations here in the state of the Yucatan. And very interestingly enough, we're working with a lot of different agencies, federal and state agencies, uh, foreign and local. And over all of these years, um, what I have found is, is that 95% of our donors and our volunteers are foreigners. I like to remind people that although the lo the foreigners are here, you know, um, they do give back to the community and they have huge hearts of gold, 90% of them. <laughs> a lot of newcomers who come, they a lot of times fall on two extremes. The one that's like, they think that everything is going to be super cheap and everything's like, you know, a gift. It's like regalado, which is not the case. Uh, but it definitely is, you know, you can definitely have a better quality of life and it is a little bit cheaper uh, than the States. Um, but yeah, I don't, uh, you can, I think you can live off $1,500, maybe not living as well as I would like. Anyways, <laughs> I feel like John and I differ a little bit in this and I think that it's really great. So I believe very firmly that you can live here off of $1,500 if you are willing to shift the way you think about living in Mexico. Now, if you think I'm going to live like I live in... I don't know, Milwaukee or whatever, and I'm gonna have this house that has this thing, and I wanna take that lifestyle and shift it into Mexico and live exactly the same, you're not gonna be successful. Mexico is an entirely different country. It's completely a different culture. It's a different way of living. So if you're willing to accept that and flow, I think you absolutely can live on $1,500. I would agree. You and comfortably. Can, you and can comfortably. live on $1,500. Comfortably. But you're not gonna buy very good mezcal with that. <laughs> <laughs> Our stand on trying to live in another country and changing the way the locals live, John and I, I mean, we've been here accumulatively between both of us 40 years, 20 and 25. 20 plus, 25, 45 years. Our neighbor, you can hear the, the goat in the, goat. the background. There's the goat. Our neighbor who loves to party every single day, Anywhere from Yo. nine or 10 in the morning with cowbells while John is trying to work online, that's his job. We would never in a million years say never something. Say a word. Because Mexico is a very live and let live country. Meaning that if I want to have a party at Monday can, at nine o'clock in the morning, nobody's going to come say something we to could, me. We could pull out five large speakers and just totally rage <laughs> right now in the middle of the day and nobody would say a word. That being said, I will say the the noise factors in the central we have had very dear friends affected by it. And the noise factors of some of the places are playing music at decibels that people inside of the clubs can't even speak. I, I, take, I take the complaints on a case by case basis. Um, you know, if you're, if you're a person just at your house, I mean, it's bad luck that stinks, but it's not really much you can do. Now have good friends of ours who have a hotel, you know, and then have a club next door. 
that's playing loud till five in the morning, what's kind of affecting their livelihood, right? Because I guess nobody wants to go stay in a hotel if you can't sleep, right? So there's, I think there's a balance to be had with it. I haven't heard people complain about it too much recently. Yeah. I think you need to wait. The general advice for things like noise and all that is like live and let live. And live also and it's live. just embrace it. It's not worth it. You know? Embrace it. No. You, know, you, you, you're, you're, you can't beat them. So you might, as, you might as well join them. Yeah. I guarantee you that if you show up with a six pack or whatever to the noise and just join the party, you'll have a lot more fun. You will be so uh, much or, happier. Or, you know, spend a couple bucks and just buy some earplugs. Call it a day. Yeah, absolutely. Some tools to cope with the cultural differences. I always tell people before you just rush in and buy a home, go live in the neighborhood first. So a lot of times people come in and they're like, I wanna buy a house in the Centro and they buy a home in the Centro and within a year they're miserable and they sell the house. I tell people you should come down, you should rent, you should do an Airbnb, you should spend some time investigating the areas that you wanna live in and not just in the morning or in the afternoon, but at night. Um, to come more of a flow mentality, embrace the culture, embrace the noise. Humble. Be humble. Be humbled. Um, also, too, to investigate and do a little bit more research. Type in, is there noise in Centro at night? Is, you know, is this school a good school? Is this doctor a good doctor? There's a lot of information out there. You know, a lot of businesses, a lot of stuff here that probably may not have, especially lo more local ones, smaller ones, aren't going to have a website but they'll have a Facebook page yeah. and you can see their promotions, their hours, their all mm -hmm. the kind of more up to date. So Facebook's a pretty good resource just in general for finding out stuff. And of course there's Facebook, Mar Facebook marketplace, which you can use for, you know, fi finding different things. Um, Facebook marketplace is a really good place to find rentals as well. I, yeah. I've told so many people about that and I'm not realizing it. And it's a great place to find rentals or homes to purchase homes. It's the other kind of, when you mentioned to, I'll hit the other advice because uh, most people who come down here, are obviously going to want internet uh, when looking for a home you should also go and check and see and test the internet because um, there's there are some areas where there's just no there just isn't good internet and it's just kind of luck of the draw closing advice or thoughts about living in mexico by local go to your little abarote tiendas those are the little stores on the corner support them first in every neighborhood, there will be fruits and vegetable markets. Please buy from them also first. Support the local artisanal art. Um, to spend your money in the local stores, not just in Costco, not just in Walmart. Yes, of course, we buy there also. But John and I make sure to support the local economy first. Be kind and respectful to the people. Obviously, that's a given. So you close the door and narrow down your experience in Mexico by not speaking Spanish, or at least not trying to speak Spanish. So some of John and I's best friends only speak Spanish. And I couldn't imagine a life without them. And I couldn't imagine a life without all the experience we've had by learning Spanish, speaking Spanish, and being part of the community here. Uh, you know, putting yourself out there as well for, for the span, like the local activities, not just going to expat places, just lean into it. Go to the village cookout, go do it Try all. to get invited to a wedding. Mexican weddings are oh, probably the, the best, best in the world. There is so. nothing better than a Mexican wedding. <laughs> but really diving into the culture and diving into everything, it's, it's a whole nother world. It's going to be awesome. But you have to be you have to come with a proper mindset. Um, you have to be willing to embarrass yourself. You have to be willing to embarrass yourself. And expand yourself and yeah. grow. Um, but it will be the best thing that you have ever done in this lifetime. Yeah. Yeah. One of the best. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, we really hope that you enjoyed our story. And maybe we'll see you soon. Yeah. And for all these helpful tips, we will accept beer and mezcal. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye.